What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the latest episode of the Get Stuff Done podcast. My name's Caden Cleveland. Of course, we have the director of OMES, Director Steve Harp. And our guest for this week is none other than the COO of the great state of Oklahoma, John Budd. Welcome, John. Thanks. Great to be here. So it's funny. So in the last podcast, we talked to Sarah Stitt. We talked about the many bosses that I have, and yeah, you're, so <laughs> yeah. So we're just going through the cycles, right. aren't we? Yeah, yeah okay. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so welcome. Thanks for coming down and doing this with us. My pleasure. So, uh, there's so much to get into. I think people are generally interested in just how servants come to Oklahoma and yeah. how and how you got into the state government gig and how that kind of give us some perspective how that worked out. Well, I think you're going to hear uh, a similar story from a lot of folks. This wasn't where they were expecting to be right now, but something just happened and they got here. Um, in my case, I worked for Sonic for about uh, five and a half years, I think. Um, and I, I had a number of roles there, mm -hmm. uh, oversaw the technology function, strategy, supply chain, and various things over time. Um, Sonic is an Oklahoma City company, but it was purchased by a company out of Atlanta. And uh, at the time, I had worked for multiple years to really roll out a brand transformation for the brand and didn't really want to continue on, didn't really see uh, continuing that next chapter at that company. And so um, in late 18, uh, I decided to leave and announce my departure, um, had uh, every intention of and, and told people I was going to take some time off and take care of my, my kids for mm -hmm. a while and just enjoy life. And uh, that, so December 18th. Uh, I like how you remember the exact date when I do, this I is do. happening. This is yeah, awesome. December 18th okay. of uh, 2018, uh, we had my going away party at Toby Keith's mm -hmm. in yeah. downtown Oklahoma City. And uh, the morning of December 19th, I had my first call with uh, one Corbin McGuire, who's done a lot of recruiting. <laughs> Infamous. Yep. Yes. So, right. yeah, the phone, the phone call, I was, right? Yeah. I had cut the ties. And then, <laughs> the most powerful man yep. in the government. <laughs> yeah, and then Corbin called, and he was recruiting for the COO job. And right. he said, you, you may never have thought about this before, mm -hmm. but I'd like, you to, I'd like to know if you'd be interested in the COO role. And I, first of all, the, and we can get into this later, uh, what's a COO for state government? Yeah, That's right. A, yeah. And the fact is it didn't exist at that time, so there's there wasn't a great answer for that. So, um, yeah, morning of December 18th, I had the, uh, the conversation with Corbin, and he said, hey, can you come over to the Capitol this afternoon? Uh, the governor-elect is there, and uh, Michael Junk, his chief of staff, are there. Uh, so at the time, I hadn't shaved for a while. I was wearing an, an Oakland A's jersey. And <laughs> Love it's, you know, it. It's 10 in the morning. Love it. Okay, do I have enough time? I shower, shave? Okay, yeah, I can get over there. <laughs> so I met the governor December 19th, uh, well after he was elected. Um, talked with him expressed you know concerns and questions mm -hmm. and then got paired up with a few other folks um, and I mean, over the next couple of weeks we were back and forth on what would the role be and right um, I remember going and having breakfast with the governor and the first lady on uh, January 1st of 19 um, my wife and I went out to Tulsa and had breakfast with them and uh, we were driving back and we stopped at the Rock Cafe in Stroud for lunch. I was sitting across the table from my wife and we had had these plans where I would stay home for a while and that was really, we were kind of zeroed in on that. Um, but I said to her, look, I don't think anything else is gonna come along. I might sit on the sidelines for six months mm -hmm. or two years or whatever. I don't think anything else is gonna come along where I'm gonna be able to have this kind of an impact. Yeah. And an impact on the state where I live and where my kids are growing up. That's right. And so, she agreed there's just no way that we could say no to this opportunity that despite the fact it was a it was a change in in plans that's so you had no uh, just that phone call happened and then just the progression of conversations after that your interest grew and grew and grew as okay you, you don't know corbin mcguire that's yeah <laughs> <laughs> man that's basically right I, every time i hear the name corbin i just i like you said one of the most powerful people nobody knows about so anyways well tell us about so so obviously the ceo of the state of oklahoma right. that that's a interesting title do you have a, are you a lifelong Oklahoman? Do you have deep ties with Oklahoma? Kind of walk us through what your right. background is. So I didn't, I don't have uh, long ties to Oklahoma. Oh, okay. I grew up in Arizona, uh, went to school in Philadelphia, bounced around a lot with GE, uh, worked for GE Capital okay. uh, for uh, eight years or so, and uh, moved all around the country, wound up in Chicago, uh, going to business school there. Man, you've been all over the place. So you've kind of seen it. I have a little it. bit, I have. Okay. Uh, well, it's got, that's got to yeah. come in valuable a little bit. Yeah, I think so. 
so I, I, I got a job out of business school there in Chicago, um, transferred that job with the Boston Consulting Group down to Dallas, um, and then came, when I decided to leave consulting, uh, I called up Cliff Hudson, the CEO of Sonic, okay. just to get his guidance on you know the next step in my career, and he wound up having a role for me to come up here for. Is that a relationship you already had? Did you just yeah, he was, he was a client up? of mine okay, when, good, I a, when I was a uh, just call up the the CEO yeah, of Sonic you know. out of the blue, get his guidance <laughs> yeah. on something. Oh, okay, cool. yeah, he's just waiting by the phone for my yeah. house. <laughs> uh, so that was my my bridge to Oklahoma City, and what's what's interesting about it, I think this is true both of the city and the state. Uh, Oklahoma City is a, a big city, yeah. but it's not so big a city that as an individual, you can't come in and have an impact. Mm. And uh, we, my wife and I have both found that to be true. Um, with Sonic, I was able to get uh, board roles on several of the, the major nonprofits around the area. Um, my wife ran for Oklahoma City Public School Board, and she's been on that for almost uh, four years now. And uh, I think that's one of the great things about this state. We have about four million people, yeah, which is substantial, right? But it's not so big. It's not so overwhelming that you can't make a difference as an individual. I think when you when you live in a city like um, Dallas, you're part of the DFW Metroplex. Yeah, that's bigger in population oh, yeah. than we are here. Chicago, bigger than we are in population here. If you want to have an impact as an individual, uh, it's it's really hard to break through and have that. So I, that's one of the reasons we really have grown some roots here mm -hmm. and uh, we've enjoyed living here. So talk a little bit about, all right, so you come on, you guys, there was a great first session, right? We get into this next, that next session, yeah. but then right in the middle of it, COVID happens. Yeah. I mean, front lines, you're in there with the governor on a daily basis, pretty much. And yeah. then you, you've you been leading the, the, not just the strategy, but the operations of the whole COVID mess uh, for Oklahoma. And it's, and it's been, uh -huh. so I got a front yeah. row seat to the as name of the task force, which is yeah. amazing. But John, talk to everyone a little bit about what that was like, setting it up, right. organizing it, uh -huh. and then... One, one little clarification real quick. So in your role of COO, uh, to, to get to that one and get more clarification yep. on it, how many different agencies are, are you actually leading during this COVID pandemic? Well, the, so that's a really complicated okay, question when you think about, about it, okay. and I, but I'm happy to go through that. We have 470 agencies, boards, and commissions, right. committees, and so forth okay. uh, in, in state government, probably 110 or so agencies per se. Um, every one of those agencies has its own governance structure. Uh, some have uh, separately elected leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, some have boards that hire their leaders. Some are appointed by the governor. We at least loosely have every agency assigned to a cabinet secretary. Okay. Uh, and that cabinet secretary sometimes has direct authority to do something with the agency. And sometimes it's a matter of influence. Sometimes it's just a conduit for communications. So the, the question's complicated, but it's uh, basically we have 470 entities in state government. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, my role is really to oversee the cabinet and coordinate the cabinet. Uh, so th gotcha. the key okay. thing is your, your question implies it's really incredible to uh, have this enormous organization. But the key by far is to have the right leaders in place. Mm -hmm. um, and my worry level goes up if I don't think we have the right leader in place. Once I think we have the right leader in place, then it's just simply a matter of aligning on goals and objectives, making sure they're working on the right things and just let them go. And I'm sure we can get into examples of some of those leaders around government. So That's anyway, cool. um, that gets to the, uh, the COVID question, right? So this was something that we all knew was, was happening in the world. In February, it was starting to come to the US. Uh, we started to get concerned. We started to do some research here. What did Oklahoma need to do? Um, the the moment of clarity really was when Rudy Gobert of the Jazz tested positive <laughs> at the Thunder game because that was uh, that's a that's an important event in the world in oh, a yeah. sense right that's a major public event. Were you oh, yeah. that night? I was not at that game. Okay. I was on. I was. Uh, it's not unusual for me to be sitting at my computer at home, kind okay. of watching what's going on in the world and right, working. Right. So I happened to be in email doing some work and checking Twitter and, and all of a sudden there's this di disruption at huh. Chesapeake Arena. Oh, no. uh, it took a while to figure out what was going on. But I, I remember that very well. The, uh, we had been talking about what, what did we need to do as a state to respond to this. And we didn't really have all that, the alignment we needed to move forward. Um, that was uh, really a moment of clarity though. And uh, I can recall the next day walking into the governor's office 
And he's a man of action. You know this. You've worked with him a long time. Uh-huh. He just he goes and he really does get stuff done. And I walked into his office, and he was on the phone tasking one of our cabinet secretaries with something, right, with, with something related to COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was Sean Copeland, but I'm not 100% sure of okay. that. And I waited for him to finish the call. My anxiety was, was building as I was listening to this because <laughs> I knew that we really didn't at that point have an overall structure and process uh-huh. and, and plan. And um, we needed to, to have that in order to really get things in shape. So I happened to have, I, I walked in uh, as soon as he, he was done with the call, I put a slide, a PowerPoint slide uh, in front of him, just showing a team structure that I proposed to, mm-hmm. to handle uh, the situation. It wasn't that, um, it was really just this need for process. Yeah. You could see that in a, in a time of chaos, what was going to happen is people were not going to stay in their swim lanes. Everybody, and you even see this in, in public, you see that everybody is a medical expert. Oh, right? yeah. Everybody's a doctor. <laughs> uh, if you read Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, <laughs> and Try to stay off of it. And yeah. you could sort of see that happening a yeah. little bit where, where everybody wanted to pile in on the health issues. Um, the point of setting up this process was really to say there are health issues and we need to make sure the health professionals are at the forefront of that there are emergency management issues we need to make sure those people are at the forefront of that there there are commerce issues there's um, there are issues in public safety and so forth great but those are a little bit off to the side Mm -hmm. right we need to have this central place where the folks working on the health and emergency management piece of this are working together our forefront in that process yeah and we drag in uh other people we pull in other people as necessary Uh, so a good example would be um this is kind of a rabbit hole but scott crow that the doc the doc director he's done incredible job Mm -hmm. managing through this crisis Uh, but scott didn't need to be in the room every day with the folks that were leading this the uh the health folks and the emergency management folks we pulled scott in for updates and and Scott knew what he needed to do in his own area. So we really set up this structure uh, out at the National Guard where leaders in the key agencies were working together, pulling data together, building a plan. And uh, I I would say my role in that was really the the facilitation of the process. Yeah, Yeah, I'm not a health expert. Um, We had folks that were experts in their own fields involved in that. Um, And I know it's been uh, it's been a rough four months for the for the country and for the state. Um, I will tell you that I think because we built up that process, we recognized we had a deficiency in personal protective equipment in the state. Uh, we had one day in our strategic national That's stockpile, right. one day. Yep. Um, I can remember the moment when the governor asked that question and got that answer, and it was pretty uncomfortable. And you're, you're talking about just the emergency equipment that was needed to available. Take masks, reserves, and gloves. Available, yeah. we, we had a like down to one day worth worth of that. Is that what you're saying? Correct. And, and like, there's a lot reserves? of reasons for that. Yeah, for yes, sure. there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, we weren't in a pandemic prior to that moment. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a, that was a real problem. Obviously, Man, that is crazy. So uh, it sounds like like one of the things that. Like, I'm sure this kind of relates to private sector as well, but to combat the a chaotic, a chaotic situation is a simple solution is just to bring structure to it. Is that kind of yeah. what, what you're saying? Yeah, and, and people will people will joke with me about it. Michael Junk will, will, tell, <laughs> will say that he, he knows I'm going to impose a process on whatever we wind up talking about. Right. Just because I, I think um, I've been in too many meetings where people spin mm-hmm. on something until they can line on, okay, so how are we going to make this decision? Who's accountable? How do we move forward? And I think until you I can identify those things, you really are gated in terms of the process. Wow. It would have been interesting to have a live feed into the uh, multi-agency center, the MAC, yeah. because it was amazing. So you have John and this organizational of, of different agency and different resources in. The National Guard, I thought, did an amazing job. I mean, true professionals. Right. I think uh, General Tommy Mancino, who day in and day out was leading that effort with his team. Uh, talk a little bit about because um, you had health, you had you had the National Guard, you had at different times you had different agency uh, representation mm-hmm. in there. Right. Um, Amy Blackburn, Trey Thompson. I mean, there were some other support staff. Yeah. Kind of talk about that interaction and what what you what you you're going to remember from all of this. Well, I will remember certainly feeling way behind in mid March and mm-hmm. how hard it was to catch up. I can. Uh, there's, there's no point, and you, I know how hard you work, Steve. There's no point bragging about hours that you work. Right. I can just, I'm just, just factually 
multiple 90 plus hours a week trying to get ahead of this thing. And it was, it was some of the hardest uh, work that I've ever had to do just to, just to get ahead of this, just yeah. to get people aligned, make sure people were focused on the right things. And uh, it, was, it was seven days a week, um, you know, as long as, as long as you can work. So I will remember the hard work. I will also remember um, just forming stronger relationships with some of the folks that I work with. Um, two folks that are not around in state government anymore are uh, two cabinet secretaries. So Casey Shrum, who is mm-hmm. uh, cabinet secretary for science and innovation, and Jerome Lothridge, who is heading up health and, health and mental health. They are just fantastic people. Yeah. Right. They're brilliant. Uh, they're world-class professionals and uh, working shoulder to shoulder with them every day uh, was was fantastic. They, they developed a public persona. They were out there speaking with the press, um, pulling together their teams. Uh-huh. I'm very happy to be in the background. I'm very happy to work on the sidelines and in a support sort of role and not actually be on camera. Uh, uh, I was, I think we worked, the three of us worked together very well as a team. And then when you add in Secretary of State Michael Rogers and Chief of Staff Michael Junk, the, the five of us really um, worked a, as a unit to try to make this thing happen. So that was that was really That's a great awesome. part it, of it. It seemed early on there was a um, decision or dedication to data, the data, in fact, yeah. trying to get the right data, correct data, and yeah. making decisions from data. Talk a little bit about because I don't think that's normal. I think, in, at least yeah. in my experience in state government, you would see very smart people, but still there's a slant towards the emotional. Yeah. Uh, but but right out of the gate, Oklahoma was just trying its best to grab data off the facts, make decisions. How did that come about? Right. Well, that's uh, all of these things are team efforts. I will say that uh, it's something that's important to me. Uh, you can't make good decisions without good data. Now, you don't have to have every piece of data to make a decision. You have to develop a comfort level at some point with what you have. Um, but we knew we didn't have information on how many hospital beds were occupied. We didn't even have great tracking information on on PPE. True. Um, we needed to have that data in order to make decisions. Yeah. So we, we worked very quickly to stand up a, a process to go out and poll for that information. Right. Um, just to understand the current state of things, and uh, it's it's nothing it's nothing but hard work. Just going out and scrapping to get the information you need. Yeah. I do think that's something I've tried to bring to everything I've done in state government. What's the information base? And when you have a disagreement with somebody, is it because you're looking at a different set of facts? Is it because one person has the facts and one doesn't? I think until you can align on here's the fact base we have. Yeah. It's not. There's not really much point in even arguing about what the decisions are. So that's that's kind of how I would frame that up. How I would sum it up, though, is uh, we pretty quickly got to the point where um, we had been very deficient in our data on testing, on PPE, on mm-hmm. hospitalization. We did get to the point relatively quickly where we were getting an A plus rating for our data quality from uh, the COVID tracking project, which wow. is. Uh, uh, underneath the banner of the Atlantic, which is not exactly a conservative magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, yeah, that's something really, I yeah. take great pride in. Uh, I'm not really the policy person. My, my role is, is government operations right. more so than policy. People can argue all day about what are the policy decisions we're making on the basis of the facts. And I participate in those arguments. What I will say, though, is I take great pride in we have the facts. You might disagree with a decision that's being made, but uh, but I'm very confident that we're being transparent about the facts. That's awesome. It's been a crazy experience. Uh, I'm sure like, I think about this all the time. Of all times of being state government, when you signed up for this gig and you had that first call and you start yeah. working through that first session, there was no way for you to know you were going to have an energy crisis, yeah. a pandemic, all the social issues that have been playing, you know, and play defund the police, all those things. Uh, and at the same time, have the, the burnout factor because yeah. it is high and uh, unemployment you know it, it, almost historic unemployment i think at times right uh, for oklahoma um, but you've you've been in a control center basically uh, i'm saying it virtually yeah. where john's mm-hmm. been pulling levers yeah to help us get solutions in place for all those things um that's got to be draining when you would go home i mean how would you recharge because seriously um at the mac so several of us could come in and out, depending on the time of season, what was going on. Mm-hmm. You know, John's had to be there the entire time leading that effort. 
So how'd you recharge? How'd you stay connected to the family? Mm-hmm. What was their experience? Well, I mean, I, I, I honestly wish I had a better answer to that question um, because I will say uh, it hasn't been as easy to keep connection with family. Sometimes when you're, when you're on a job and you're working a lot of hours, um, priorities, priorities aside, you, you don't have time to do everything you want to do. Mm-hmm. So um, I'd, I'd like to do a better job of that going forward. Um, my wife, though, uh, understands, my kids understand uh, my wife will tell you she's she's glad I'm in the role that I'm in, and right. it, it, it gives her comfort that I'm doing the, the job that I'm doing. But honestly, uh, there are times in my life when I've done a much better job of uh, of achieving work life balance. <laughs> so it, it's it'll happen. It'll yeah. happen. It just hasn't happened yet. It goes back to that like where we started the potential for impact that yeah. you're able to have here. Surely that's got to be like your you say your wife yeah. is proud of the the position you're in and, and surely it goes into the impact that you're having every single right. day for our state so 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 the COVID experience hasn't stopped yet we're still in that yeah and then also we have now cares yeah talk a little bit about cares and, and what's going on with that uh, basically right. 1.2 billion and you, john's been heavily involved in, in getting that money from federal government and right. getting right. it dispensed out yeah. Yeah, so with, with the CARES Act, the state has $1.25 billion of coronavirus relief funds, and those have to be deployed against uh, COVID-related expenses. They have to be spent by December 30th of this year. Um, you can't just put them against wish list items. They have to actually have to be against things that are COVID-related. Right. Um, part of that is reimbursing agencies like health or OMES or uh, human services who've had COVID-related expenses. Right. Part is uh, d- deployed against reimbursing cities and counties. And then part is is things like um, how should we invest this money to help the state recover? Right. We've put $100 million against a business relief program. This is where businesses who'd suffered uh, 25% revenue loss year over year could uh, could apply for a grant, and we've we've deployed those mm-hmm. funds there. And that all goes to the Department of Commerce? That is does. That, right? that, okay, that does. We have uh, an eviction mitigation program we put in place. Uh, to help uh, folks who've been evicted due to COVID. You can't just, uh, by rule, can't apply to all evictions, right. but to, to help folks who've been evicted due to a COVID-related right. uh, expense. Something, Steve, I know you've been very involved with. Uh, uh, OESC, the Employment <laughs> Security Commission, has a 1985 uh, mainframe. mainframe, something like that. Yeah. And uh, we're putting funds against uh, upgrading their mainframe. So we're looking at those sorts of projects right. that, that make sure that we're handling this better. There's tons of money being deployed against um, health, so improving our, te- our testing and contact tracing, um, getting some mobile units so that the more rural communities can be served. Um, so it's a, a long list of things that we're deploying the money against just to make sure that we're able to handle this pandemic better. So how much of it is, when you, when you receive project requests and things yep. like that, it's just got to be the immediate things, right? So things that, like you said, reimbursement and things like that, right. uh, but also the uh, getting support to those businesses and individuals who are having trouble. How much of it is also related to preparing the state to for future events like like you mentioned OESC right. technology, better better implementation yep. there. Um, how much of, of the thinking is it around that too, of preparing us for other other events that might happen? Well, uh, first the federal rules are it has to be about this pandemic. It can't be about the next one. So we do have to think about these aren't okay. these aren't multi-year projects they have to be things that we can get in place now so they have to be in place by the 30 is that that correct okay correct now now i will say though you fix oesc once you fix the mainframe one time Mm -hmm. and it'll help if there's an uh, another oil crisis it'll help for so we are keeping in mind both short and long-term needs okay um but but yeah this is all about how do we better handle the current pandemic gotcha Uh, and if it helps us with the future fantastic so how do you feel the state's doing strategically at this point? I mean, it's, it's you have a business plan that's yep. been executed, COVID gets thrown into it, but we still have strategic goals yep. that we're trying to achieve. How, how would you characterize that? Well, I'd say a couple things on that. The first one is um, one of the first things that I did with every cabinet secretary was to set five-year goals with them, or four-year goals with them, rather, and then one-year goals. And they're all marching towards those goals. We refreshed them this year to three-year goals, mm-hmm. um, so kind of con- yeah. uh, narrowing down that window. Um, every cabinet meeting, we go through every cabinet secretary's goals and how they're achieving those goals. So I think we're still going down that path. Realistically, 
Um, the, uh, the pandemic throws a, a major kink into those things, and there's a lot of things that get delayed right. uh, due to that. I think a, a great example actually of a success would be one of uh, the public safety goals was really Im implementing real ID. Uh, this was something that had been in the works for a long time, and, and really the state had not made a lot of progress. Uh, we sat down with the vendor and with the various agencies involved, and we said, we're going to get this done by this date. Come hell or high water, this will get done. Or else. <laughs> and uh, you know, there was a little bit of an or else attached to it. But, but uh, we said, we're going to just get this done. And then the pandemic hit, and we said, you know what? We're still going to get it done. Wow. We, okay. can't, we can't launch it. Uh, the, you can't issue driver's licenses uh, when that deadline hits because the offices are closed. Right. We're still going to get it done. And we did. So public safety especially drove this with, with vendors and, mm -hmm. and support from uh, OMES and other, other folks. But, yeah, they, they got it done. So there are great examples of where even the, in the course of the pandemic, people were able to achieve their goals. But, yeah, it, it threw us off track. I, I think it's also use, useful to talk about, though, the, uh, the governor's scorecard. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, the governor's – I think we're calling it dashboard, actually. Governor's dashboard. So what uh, – because we've seen yeah. kind of headlines on yeah. this kind of – what was – what – what is it, I guess? Can you kind of walk sure. us through the idea of it? Sure, I can. Um, we, we talked last year about the need for, if, if, you, if you got rescued from a desert island, you wanted to know what happened in Oklahoma, or where did we stand as a state? What right. are the important metrics to look at? Okay. How do you get that down to one or two pages? Mm -hmm. And that's what the dashboard is. It's the key metrics to look at to track progress in the state. There are metrics around uh, public safety, like crime rates, uh, there's incarceration rates, recidivism rates. So that's uh, the, basically mm -hmm. the percentage of the population that's uh, prison population that's let out and comes back within right. three years. Um, there are ag metrics, education metrics. Um, basically, most every broad area you'd think about in state government, there is a metric for it. What we're doing there is we are looking at the current value of the metric, how it's changed over the last year and over the last quarter, and then what it would take to be top 10 in that metric, where we can get a comparable metric. Okay. Um, some things we had to choose, you, you know, you just can't get a, a comparable metric for it. So we've done a lot to improve the number of agricultural acres under conservation, but you can't get that metric for other states. Yeah, right. Okay. But, but there are ones that we can benchmark. Crime rates you can benchmark. Um, certainly gross domestic product mm -hmm. or uh, unemployment rates you can benchmark. Um, so we have a good idea now of where we need to be in order to be top 10 in these metrics. Um, it's available on the web. Uh, we, we talked about it last week. We issued a press release about it last yeah. week. And uh, what I'm really proud of is how many things are going well in the state. <clears throat> in, in these metrics, the vast majority of them are green, and right. green means that they're improving. Right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean we're top ten. It means they're right. improving. <clears throat> but you have that listing, right? If I remember correctly, next to each of the metrics, it'll show where we think we're ranked on, on those things. E exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, there are a few metrics that are not green. Um, right now, our labor force participation rate is down. That's, that's generally COVID-related. Mm -hmm. uh, gross domestic product is down. The economy has slowed down. Right. Unemployment uh, had been not green. It hadn't been improving. Uh, the data from May to June, though, showed a lot of improvement. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that trending in the right direction. Right. But clearly, the economic metrics are not right. going to be where we wanted to be. Uh, but things like um, transportation, the, the number of structurally deficient bridges were mm -hmm. uh, improving in that. Very much so. All yeah. of the public safety metrics. Um, so, so really... The headline is, as it should be, uh, the COVID pandemic. It's, it's the first thing I think of when I wake up in the morning and the last thing I think of when I go to bed mm -hmm. at night. Um, and that's, I think, as it should be. But the reality is you still have to run state government. You still have to provide human services to people. Right. Uh, you still have to manage public safety. And we can't take our eye off all of the, those other things, even though they will take a backseat to the pandemic. So do, do the kids have any aspirations to follow in dad's footsteps and serving the state and government or otherwise? Is that servant? It's an interesting question. Now, my, my boys are 12 and 14. Uh -huh. 
if you were to ask them what they wanted to do, video game design probably is high on the list. Let's so, go. Uh, okay. <laughs> they've had plenty of opportunities since March <laughs> to work on their video game playing. Yeah. Um, they've been generating ideas, right, for those designs. Yeah. It's, so <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I know uh, you, you have kids. You know that every one of them is a little bit different. Right. Sure. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I think my older son will wind up going into something that is – it may be business oriented. Um, my younger son's really, really loves working with his hands. And I think, you know, he'd be a great uh, construction worker. He'd be a great person doing right. that sort of hard work every day. Mm-hmm. Um, so who, who knows what they're going to do? I don't think either of them have really expressed an interest to follow in my exact <laughs> steps. Well, kind of talk through the, uh, <clears throat> the structure of the secretary. So how many cabinet secretaries do we have? Uh, how did you guys build the team? What was important to you during that yeah. process? So we have 14 cabinet secretaries, uh, including me. Um, we, we broke them up. We, we certainly looked at what other states were doing. We looked at what Oklahoma had done in the past to determine what roles we needed. Um, and they're largely logical. You have a secretary of public safety mm-hmm. and health and mental health, commerce, um, commerce and workforce development, I should say. Right. Uh, so they kind of fall along natural lines. I do think something we've done that's been critical is the interview process. We, my impression is that traditionally in state governments, cabinet secretaries are appointed on the basis of a personal relationship, uh, right? Or somebody that was, hey, this, this guy served in this administration, let's mm-hmm. bring him back. We have handled that very differently. Mm-hmm. We interview every cabinet secretary uh, before they come in. Um, We have several folks who've not served in state government before, and I interview them the same way I would interview somebody in the outside world. I ask them for examples of where they've done something in the past. I really get a sense of uh, how how they'll fit into the culture we're Mm -hmm. trying to create. And some people are not used to that. Some people are used to more coming in and just, hey, if I... If this guy likes me, he's going to hire me. Um, I don't. I don't interview that way. I think we've tried to not make sure we don't interview mm-hmm. that way. And the single biggest insight I've had out of that, I think somebody can come in from the business world and be successful in state government. But the key thing is they have to. They have to know what they don't know. Hmm. The the people that I've interviewed that think they have all the answers. Uh, that I don't sense that they have intellectual curiosity around how s- government's going to be different from what they're used to. Right. Um, they maybe have a little too much pride. Um, and sometimes it's just one of those characteristics. It's not like they, they check all those negative <laughs> boxes. But, but th- those folks are the ones that I just know they're not going to work. Huh. You have to come in and respect the state government employees that are content experts that have been here for a long time. Just right. thinking about the team you've built at OMES. Um, you have a lot of people who've been there. You've built your team around folks that are existing employees. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of great people in state government. I think to come in from the outside and assume that job one is to, to clear the decks, that is just not going to be successful. Right. So I, I went through that experience with John, and the truth is it was more about listening and then um, how, like, talking through how you would solve problems even if your solution wasn't necessarily the solution, how you think through those things. I think you'll find through John's leadership and uh, others that are hiring in in leadership positions, it's more about the way you think. And it's more about being a team player, how you think, and and literally uh, what you can do and how energized you are to go do those things. Right. I think the days, not that there's been a lot of talented people come through state government. I think, unfortunately, um, even when I came in, I I didn't know if I want to do it, didn't know what kind of talent we're going to have. Uh, at our disposal, but I think like you, I mean, you find, you're, you're OMES director, you find there's a lot of talented people here. Uh, a lot of it is enablement, getting out of their way, but also making sure you get the right people who uh, do do have the right thought processes, are open-minded, are trying to, yeah. you know, not build kingdoms and just tr- turn them loose. And, and at least that's, it's it's an easy story why OMES has had some success. We still got a lot of things we need to do for sure, right. but that's been the basis of all of it. Right. Well, Secretary, thank or, or sorry, COO, sorry. <laughs> or John, you just got me. Okay, yeah, well, fine. <laughs> John, thank you so much for, for coming on the show here. Steve, is there anything else that you wanted to pick it, pick his brain about? I mean, like no, there's but, so, but, much, so many different things that we could uh, bring up because <clears throat> you're involved in just about everything. No, I'd say but one comment. So it's, 
I have this conversation a lot outside of this podcast, yeah. which is in this time of government, you know, uh, during COVID and all the things we've already kind of covered, I, I really believe that there are certain people that are in their roles at the perfect time, and John's one of them. John's an amazing strategist, mm. but he's also very good with operational components and relationships. Um, behind the scenes, he's done a great job working with the legislature. Uh, he's done a great job uh, helping the governor manage through a very difficult time. Yeah. Um, you know, he's my partner and boss, you know, and uh, get to lean on him and get to talk to him on a usually biweekly basis. But we work more often than that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's just great working with guys like John because um, the chemistry is good, but also we're all in it for the same reasons. Right. It's, it's not mm-hmm. um, it's not for any of our benefit or glory. It's, it's literally just to try to help four million Serve. people. Right. And it's been and it. But it started with John. The whole servanthood started Agreed. with John. Yep. OMS mission statement, which I haven't changed, still is that OMS is here to serve those who serve Oklahomans. And John built that and started that with the executive team we had at the time. So I, I, seriously, it's been a, a great pleasure. I know we got a lot more to do, but thank you. I'm, it's Oklahoma didn't know how lucky they are to have John at, at the helm. Well, I will say so, one thing about that. So we have, uh, we have adopted kids hmm. and people will tell us sometimes how lucky those kids are that we adopted them. And I turn it back, right back around and say how lucky we are that we had that opportunity. And I will say the same thing about that. Um, I feel incredibly fortunate to have this role for the state and to have the sort of chance to have an impact and really to truly try to make people's lives better. That's what I'm here for. So yeah. uh, I'm really grateful that I've had this chance to do that. And like you said, Oklahoma's the spot to do it, right? It's Absolutely. the opportunity to make, make things happen and make make an impact. Um, and I think we we all see that on a day-to-day basis. So, well... John, thank you so much for coming on the show again. Um, it truly been a pre- pleasure just learning more about the ways that you're serving um, those who serve Oklahomans. I mean, you like literally the, the, the motto that you put for OMS, you're living it every single day. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, well, thank you so much for listening yeah. to another episode of the Get Stuff Done podcast. We'll have uh, another episode coming out soon. Keep an eye out for that. Uh, in the meantime, you guys have a great day, and we'll see you soon. Bye, guys.